Hi, everybody. Welcome to Petroleum Prospects and Politics. I'm Chris Milroy. I'm the conference chair. And uh, we're very excited to have you all here for uh, such fantastic speakers on such an interesting topic, very timely. Uh, we're going to start off tonight uh, by hearing from our university's president, uh, Robert Zimmer. And we're going to be, when, as we look across kind of the whole landscape of what we're going to be dealing with uh, over the next two days, um, an important part to consider is the role of research institutions and policy informing institutions like the University of Chicago. And so it's important for us to hear from somebody like our president, um, and he will help us, I guess, look at the role that the university should be taking in forming the future uh, of oil. So if we could hear now from the uh, president, Robert Zerr. Thank you. Well, it's uh, really a great pleasure to be able to uh, welcome all of you here uh, formally on behalf of the University of Chicago uh, to this um, Chicago Society's uh, Conference on Petroleum. Uh, we appreciate having so many uh, policy leaders, intellectual leaders joining us for this discussion, uh, but I'm really particularly pleased uh, that Today's events have been planned by our students, as you see. Their efforts here are a demonstration of our students' great thoughtfulness when tackling critical issues. Uh, over the years, the Chicago Society has organized events on topics uh, ranging from business, business ethics to the literary traditions of Kashmir uh, to the media and public interest. Uh, today's event is, of course, yet another example of their commitment uh, to bringing together our students and faculty with practitioners to engage essential issues, uh, such as the one that this conference represents on petroleum, its uh, prospects, and politics. Uh, the petroleum issue, of course, is just a piece of the larger issue uh, dealing with energy. I think everybody realizes that energy is going to be an issue that's going to be with us uh, for many decades to come. Uh, it's a fascinating topic uh, in the sense that it's simultaneously an economic issue, a technical issue, a political issue, and a social and cultural issue. And the implications, uh, I don't need to tell anybody in this room, are really profound uh, both for, uh, for economic well-being of the already industrialized world, for, um, for, uh, for developing economies, uh, and for uh, geopolitical stability. Uh, so this is not a small topic, and uh, I think that, uh, that this conference is being organized here, uh, particularly at the University of Chicago, is very reflective of how universities in general, and this university in particular, uh, really needs to address problems of this scale. Uh, one of the wonderful things about uh, this university, and we're not unique in this way, but it certainly is a very important feature of this university, is that we've always taken the view that problems should be actually tackled on their own terms and bringing whatever disciplines are necessary to bear in order to understand these problems. And I think that the program uh, for, uh, for this meeting is very reflective of that. Another interesting feature of the University of Chicago, of course, is that we operate two labs for the two national laboratories for the uh, Department of Energy. And, uh, and aside from the University of California, we're actually the only university to be operating uh, two such labs. So we have a very long standing and deep interest uh, in this area. Uh, in, just in closing, I, I do wish to thank uh, very specifically the students of the Chicago Society, uh, particularly Dan McKelly, uh, president of the Society, and Chris Milroy and Jeffrey Crane, the coordinators of this conference, uh, for organizing the events uh, for tonight and tomorrow. Uh, in addition, I'd like to thank our uh, faculty colleagues, my colleagues, Alan Sanderson and Grace uh, Chang, in the economics department, Charles Lipson in the political science department, and Jim Leitzel in the Harris School for the support they've given to the Chicago Society and to this conference in particular. And finally, I'd like to thank all of you who have come to participate in this conference in any form uh, whatsoever and for your engagement in the, um, in the work of the next two days. 
So finally, let me uh, just conclude by wishing you all a very productive and enjoyable time here during this conference. Thank you. Thank you very much, President Zimmer, for your remarks. I'm Jeffrey Crane, the conference vice chair. On behalf of Chicago Society, I would also like to extend our thanks to the student activities and international house staffs with, without whom this event would not have been possible. We'd also like to extend our gratitude to our sponsors, uh, Student Government, the Graduate School of Business, the George J. Stigler Center for the Study of Economy in the State, the Global Voices Fund at the University of Chicago, the Norman Waite Harris Fund, the College, the Irving B. Harris Graduate School of Public Policy Studies and the Office of Community Affairs. Oil is perhaps the most international of commodities. In the past century, many global conflicts have been shaped by oil. The stability of the international oil supply is of great importance to every government in the world. The reliance of the entire transportation sector on oil means that oil crises can drastically affect actions at every level, from decisions to drive or take public transportation to the cost of military deployments and inflation. One of the priorities of every government is thus to monitor events in the international sphere that affect the price and availability of oil. The role of the Office of Policy and International Affairs in the Department of Energy is to provide advice to the Secretary of Energy on these issues. It is now my great privilege to introduce our opening keynote speaker, the Honorable Alan Hegberg, Deputy Assistant Secretary for, of Energy for International Energy Policy. Mr. Hegberg's responsibilities at the Department of Energy cover the Middle East, Africa, Russia, and the Caspian. He has also been responsible for international political analysis at Phillips Petroleum, Amico, and British Petroleum. Uh, please join me in welcoming the Honorable Alan Hegberg. Thank you, Jeff. Thanks, uh, Professor Zimmer, and, Zimmer, and thanks uh, for everyone uh, who had a hand in making this uh, making this happen. I congratulate you, this, uh, the students, for all the work and, uh, and effort uh, you have undertaken. Um, I know you're you're going to have an interesting time here because I know some of the participants who are distinguished, uh, uh, present company excluded, and I'm assuming you can have a good interchange, a debate and perhaps add, uh, shed some light on some of the issues that uh, surround us today. Um, I was identified as honorable, and I have to correct the record. I haven't been confirmed by the Congress, so I'm not honorable officially. And many people in my family say I'm not even honorable per uh, personally. Um, I, uh, I really enjoy coming to Chicago. Um, some of you may know that uh, I claim lineage from various ethnic ancestors on the South Side, uh, but I don't want to be uh, typecast of being from the South Side because I've lived on the North Side in the, in the Northern suburbs, the Western suburbs, downtown, and in, uh, in Old Town. So I am one of those people who, uh, who moves a lot more than I should. Um, God willing, if I live long enough, I may make it to Hyde Park yet. But. Chicago is famous for a lot of things, as you all know. For those of you who are just new to Chicago, uh, I'll give you a list of things that I think Chicago is most known for. Uh, one is obviously the lake and the beautiful lake setting, which we have to thank uh, a number of far-sighted people back in the turn of the century. A wonderful architecture, for not just here, but in other parts of the city, too. An amazing urban renaissance, friendly folk, world-class food, and in sports, championship, Championship caliber teams. Uh, I know it's still sticking in people's uh, people's craws to what's happened over the last couple of years, and hopefully at some point the Olympics. Um, and if they do, we agreed before we came in here that uh, the CTA will have to be renovated. Um, but I wanted to say a little bit about the uh, ethnic diversity of this city and uh, the the view of politics here because it has influenced uh, many of us. Uh, and the way we work, but also in how we relate to uh, uh, foreign officials. And uh, this is sort of, these are an aside, but these are sort of uh, true stories. Um, when I was working here in Chicago for Amico, um, I was in charge of bringing foreign leaders to, this, to the city on behalf of Amico. Uh, and these were the people we were trying to cultivate uh, so we could get an investment opportunity in their country. 
And as I think you probably all know, um, as soon as we invited a foreign leader from whatever country, the diaspora in Chicago knew he was coming. And we heard from them before we heard officially from the government that he was going, he or she was going to come for a visit. And immediately they descended upon us because they wanted to be part of it. And so we always had to find a way to make the local diaspora groups part of it. Um, one of them uh, was a, a Palestinian uh, uh, official who was here, and we were having a dinner for him when there were a number of people of the local Palestinian community from the city who were outside wanting to see him. And um, we said, well, we'll finish dinner, and then he'll go out and talk with you. Well, it got later and later, and as a result, the crowd got a little bit upset. So I was sent out to try to deal with them. Now, for those of you who know about Palestinian politics, it is intensely political. It's fractured. It's uh, it's debated over everything, and you're never quite sure which group you're talking to. And I thought, I'm going to go into this crowd, and I will never come out because I will be caught up in this political maelstrom. Well, uh, it turns out that uh, they were anxious about seeing this person, and not because of political reasons, but because they were all afraid they were going to meet, miss their last train to Downers Grove. So in this case, politics was preempted by logistics. Uh, so if you're ever going to host someone, host them early so those people who are coming in from the suburbs can get home because otherwise they're going to be really upset. An even better case occurred with uh, Haider Aliyev, who was the, then the late Haider Aliyev, who was then the president of Azerbaijan. And for those of you who have, have studied this, uh, this is uh, an interesting man in a lot of ways. He went from the Soviet Politburo to president of his country sort of in a seamless transition, but he was a very able and interesting guy. And we brought him here because we were pursuing an investment in the largest uh, uh, opportunity in the Caspian up to that time and the largest one that has ever been developed. Um, and we uh, took him on a tour because he, uh, he was an architect by training. And we had him on the lake, and so what we decided to do late in the afternoon is we would give him an architectural tour up the river. And so we had one of these boats with the top cut off. For those of you who don't know about there's a wonderful architectural tour that takes you up the river. And we were coming along, and at that point, the Corps of Engineers decided to release water into the river for um, navigation purposes further downstream, so the river was quite high. And we got to the Michigan Avenue Bridge. And it was 4 o'clock in the afternoon. And we couldn't get under the bridge, so the bridge had to be opened. So well, how do you get the bridge opened? Well, in Chicago, you call the mayor. Because for those of you who remember the story about snow, this is a similar story. So we called the mayor's office, and we said, President Aliyev from Azerbaijan is here, and we would like for you to open the bridge. And the answer was something like, who? What? At 4 o'clock in the afternoon, you want me to disrupt rush hour to let some guy I don't even know go under the bridge? Guess what? The bridge didn't get opened. At this point, people in my position see their careers disappearing, as well as the best commercial opportunity that we had in a long time. So we had to figure out how to do it. And the captain of the architectural boat came to our rescue and said, well, we'll just sort of lie down on the deck. And as a result, here we all were lying down on the deck, and we got under the bridge. As we're getting up, I can just see here is a very serious man. This is a president of a country. And he's got this smile on his face. And he said in Russian to uh, a colleague of mine, he said, you know, the mayor was right. I wouldn't have opened the bridge either. <laughs> we knew we could work with this guy when we heard that. At any rate, um, unfortunately, he's no longer in power. He passed away several years ago. Uh, but he was actually uh, a very, very able man and understood a lot of what is needed to make investment happen in his, uh, in, in his country. I would um, like to just make a uh, couple of comments uh, to sort of set the stage uh, about um, energy policy in the U.S. because I know the conversation tomorrow and perhaps even later today um, we'll, can talk about some of these issues. Um, one, so one part has to do with the transformation of the U.S. energy economy over the last 30 years. And it's not a very well-known story, but it's an important story because it actually has happened, perhaps not like anybody anticipated, but certainly it's a different energy economy we live in uh, than we did back in the 1970s. And then 
I would like to say something about um, some foreign policy decisions that were made early on that have repercussions today, and then sort of talk about how we might see the next energy transformation from this point now forward, because obviously the energy economy in the world is changing for a variety of reasons, and we can talk a little bit about what some of those reasons are. Uh, the first and the most, I think, significant decision that was made uh, on the policy level uh, in the last 30 years was a decision to deregulate oil and decontrol natural gas prices in this country. Up to that time, the government intervened in the marketplace for a whole host of reasons to protect uh, domestic interests and to protect others. And as a result, we had uh, an oil and gas sector that was not competitive uh, and that was uh, not economic. Now, I know there are economists here who are going to disagree with me on this, and which is fine, and I hope we can. Uh, but the policy decision to deregulate oil prices uh, was a serious one, and it was taken by the president, which gives you an idea how serious it was. Now, for those of you of a certain age, the question always is, who decided to deregulate oil prices in the United States? Which president? Carter. Carter's right. But if the, someone knows. But invariably, uh, Ronald Reagan gets credit for that because what he did was he accelerated the final deregulation when he came into office. And the, instruction, the instructive point there is if you're going to change uh, the energy economy, you don't do it abruptly, you do it in stages. And what Carter had done was he had deregulated oil prices according to a stage. And the last stage was coming at the end of 1980, early 1981. And of course he had lost the election so he was on his way out and Reagan was in. He asked President Reagan if he could announce the full deregulation, and President Reagan said no, and then turned around as soon as he was inaugurated and deregulated the last, whatever, 10% of, of prices. Now, that's a political decision, and that's a legitimate political decision, but it's also a very important policy decision. Um, and it took a fair amount of work to get that done because there were people in Congress who didn't want it to happen, and there were people in the administration who didn't want it to happen. It was, it was political leadership at the presidential level. Um, and that has had a fundamental impact uh, on our economy, and certainly on our energy economy. And our energy economy today, uh, and it's not over, uh, is certainly more efficient than it was then. Uh, we have a refining sector, uh, for those who know anything about refining, which is, has fewer refineries, uh, but larger capacity. It is world scale. Uh, companies have invested and upgraded the refinery capacity. So we have a commercial refinery capacity that can handle a variety of crude oils as opposed to being dependent on solely one kind or another in the past. Um, and we have, I, I think, um, um, an energy economy that's fully integrated uh, into the international energy economy. And by that I mean uh, in a whole whole variety of ways what happens internationally affects us because the companies operate internationally. Uh, they, they produce crude oil, they bring it here for their refineries. It is a very large commercial market and it's often when discussing and thinking about energy security people lose track of the fact that this is one of the largest commercial markets in the world and the decisions on production and refining by companies are made independent of the government. They're made for largely commercial reasons and for profit reasons. Um, we have uh, stimulated uh, additional investment in non-oil uh, uh, non, uh, non sources, and we'll talk about that later, I think, uh, today and tomorrow. Um, and uh, the IOCs, or the international oil companies, uh, left their base in the United States and invested heavily overseas. Um, and of not just ExxonMobil, but some of the smaller companies, uh, Anadarko, Apache, these companies are investing in foreign countries and partly because there are not enough good assets to invest in, in uh, oil production now in the United States, uh, part because they want a more diverse portfolio, part because they can get re better returns, uh, but our, our companies uh, and foreign companies that work here, of which there are several, um, look at the marketplace in an international and an integrated manner. So they make decisions on where they're going to invest based on a wide portfolio, not a narrow portfolio. And of course, most people in the political uh, part of the, of the world in this country prefer everything to happen here. Well, it just doesn't work that way. And at the end of the day, it shouldn't work that way. But there is always this tension uh, about 
investing here as opposed to investing overseas. Um, the other thing um, that we did back in the 70s as a result of the uh, Arab embargo, uh, Secretary Kissinger proposed the creation of something called the International Energy Agency. And it was set up in 1974, and it still exists today. And what's important about this organization, it is a collective mechanism for all the governments that belong, almost all the OECD countries belong, to respond to an oil supply disruption. Uh, it's collective in the sense that you share the burden. It's semi-automatic. Uh, it has a very elaborate system for sharing crude oil, but that's never been used and it will never be used. Uh, the design was to share oil uh, on, the, on the high seas, and the idea from the United States perspective was to protect us from being uh, affected in our foreign policy in the Middle East by oil supply uh, decisions by uh, governments in that region. And I, at those, in those days, it, uh, it depended. I mean, the, the Arab oil embargo was launched by the Saudis, so uh, it was conceivable it was aimed at the Saudis. Um, what we have now is a mechanism that's still collective, but it's informal. And it's had a, a, a ongoing consultations among the governments during a supply interruption to try to bring crude or product to those markets that are short. And the most recent case where this happened was in Hurricane Katrina. And when the administration actually convinced uh, and others volunteered to supply oil, the Japanese actually did some. And the Europeans allowed their refiners to draw down their uh, gasoline stocks um, and jet fuel uh, so they could come to the United States. And this comes in a commercial manner. It's not the government mandating how it happens, but it comes by arbitrage in the North Atlantic Basin. This is more than you'll ever need to know about arbitrage, but people will then, once those stocks they know are going to be available, they'll get tankers, and those tankers will come to the U.S. And they came to places that really did need, uh, need a petroleum product, which was in the southeast. Uh, and it was those stocks coming in from Europe, which we normally get uh, uh, petroleum products from Europe anyway, but these were additional ones uh, that actually helped uh, avoid a serious, uh, a serious problem uh, of gasoline shortages in certain parts of the country. And that still exists, and it's important that we keep it. Uh, the IA does a lot of other things now, but it's a foreign policy tool that exists for use by the OECD countries and the United States, and the United States is considered a leader in it, although we always do have our differences with the Germans and some of the others. That was sort of what got us to where we are. Um, let me talk for a minute about what has happened in the market uh, over the past uh, several years and get to some of the, of the political issues that are on uh, the table. Um, and there are three topics I'd like to, to mention. One is uh, a decline in heritage assets, and I'll, I'll tell you, I'll talk about that in a minute. One is resource nationalism, and that has many manifestations, and it's discussed in the press a lot, and it's discussed in the political debate a lot. And the third is this question of governance in uh, countries around the world, and how they actually govern their societies, but also how they govern uh, their oil and gas assets. Um, Heritage assets. Uh, in the industrial sector, in oil and gas, in nuclear, in coal, and everywhere, uh, a company will invest as much as it can in a producing asset as long as they can get additional returns. And in oil, because once you start producing, you, it starts declining uh, because it's a natural resource, you have to continue to invest in that resource to continue to keep the production up. And Sometimes, if the prices are right and everything else, once you have all your infrastructure in place, you can invest in satellites around there, which were not economic before, but which are, inve uh, which are inve economic now. And that means you're investing continuously in your heritage assets, those that are already on your books, those that are producing, those that are giving you cash and profit, and you want to keep them running as long as it's economically possible. And this happened a lot in the North Sea. Uh, a number of companies that had early discoveries in the North Sea kept investing in the North Sea. And one of the reasons the North Sea production profile did not decline as rapidly as some thought it would was because it was, it flattened out because companies continued to revest and bring in those smaller accumulations of oil and gas to the marketplace. 
some of those are seeming, appear to be uh, less attractive now. And if that's the case, then companies will not invest in those heritage assets, uh, and they will have to go uh, out, out more broadly to find uh, other places to invest. Um, and where they go, generally, is either offshore in the United States, particularly the deep offshore, um, if they can do gas uh, in Alaska or anywhere on the North Slope, they will do that. Uh, but they have to look for those places in the world that will accept equity investment. And in general, everybody in the world, with the exception of three countries, <coughs> excuse me, accepts equity investment. And those three countries are Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, and Mexico. <coughs> Others accept it on very tough terms, and it's not attractive or it's, uh, um, you know, the accumulations are not large enough. Uh, the one that, of course, is of most interest now to most companies is Iraq. And we can talk about Iraq if you want to. Iraq has 27 producing oil fields. It has a lot of oil, and it has not been produced uh, efficiently, economically, or properly over the past 25 years. And obviously, equity investors, when they invest, will do that. Whether they can or not is quite another question. Um, and whether or not it can come online very fast or not uh, is quite another question also. Uh, but it's, it's important to see where they have invested over the last several years. And, of course, the largest areas of new investment are, have been Russia, uh, the Caspian, and uh, offshore West Africa. And those investments made five, six, seven years ago are now starting to bear fruit because it takes that long to bring the production up uh, to produce it. So the Caspian is ramping up. Uh, Kazakhstan has production. They'll have more production in a few years. Azerbaijan is adding more capacity and producing more as the companies invest to bring more uh, online. Uh, West Africa, for those of you who know anything about Angola and Equatorial Guinea and deep offshore Nigeria, uh, there are uh, quite prolific fields coming online. ExxonMobil has a large field coming on next year. These are, <clears throat> these are important investments. They're important because <coughs> partially because of the quality of the crude, partially because uh, the equity investors will own rights and shares of that crude oil, uh, and partly because if you want to use oil uh, in a marketplace and not be reliant only on one, these are, these are diversified sources. And in Russia. And Russia, uh, as many of you know who probably studied Russia, when the Soviet Union collapsed, oil production collapsed in Russia also. And it was brought back uh, largely by foreign equity investors investing in fields that had been badly managed over the years. Uh, BP has done this, um, and that, that slug of oil is now coming back to the market. And then there are some new fields that are coming online uh, uh, and ramping up both in oil and gas uh, that haven't been producing before. Sacklin is one, uh, and that will be a prolific field. Uh, but investors have been exposed over the past uh, several years in Russia to coercive behavior uh, by, the, uh, by the Russian administration, whether it's on the tax side or various other things. Um, and the administration in Russia is clear that they want uh, companies to, uh, to essentially be national champions. And if that's the case, then the Russian companies will get preeminence. Uh, and that has uh, worried a number of people. It worries the administration because, as we said, we like an integrated oil market that everybody is free to produce and export and do whatever they want without uh, undue uh, interference by the government. Uh, we have not seen that as much in the Caspian, and nor in Nigeria um, or in Angola, um, although there are in, in various places, and Algeria is a classic example, governments are starting to extract greater rents uh, out of the companies from their production at a time when prices are higher and when they're violating their contracts. The companies are all operating under contracts that they signed with the government, and they have clauses that are to protect them from tax increases, and those governments are ignoring that. And that's a form of resource nationalism. They're not taking the asset. What they are doing is taking the profit, a greater share of the profits than what, was, what had been agreed previously. Uh, we've seen that. We're seeing that in China also. I mean, it is relatively common in some of the larger, uh, larger places. Um, that's, 
that's a, a problem is if your heritage asset base is declining and you've got to find new places and those new places are less attractive, uh, the companies then uh, are at a competitive disadvantage, particularly when they're competing against state oil companies who are in the business now also. And of course, you've all heard about the Chinese state oil companies who are uh, in Darfur and they're in Sudan and they're in various other places. Um, and there is a debate, and I would defer to you, about how these Chinese companies operate. If they operate under the control and influence of the central government or if they're operating independently. I think there's a fair amount of uh, body of evidence that suggests they are absolutely op operating on their own. And they have certain advantages when competing with a private oil company and the fact that they don't have to worry about their debt. Um, they, so they can take a lower return on their investment uh, and they can operate uh, off off the books in ways that uh, you know, most international oil companies don't operate. So they're, a, they're an intense competitor. Uh, they have received uh, 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 some gas blocks in Saudi Arabia, which is the first time that any equity investment has been inv uh, able to invest in either the oil or gas sector uh, in, the, in Saudi Arabia. Um, and the Chinese have, are, are there. And what the host governments are doing then are they are signing deals with some of these governments and the Saudis have signed a large deal with, uh, with uh, China uh, on the refining sector that the Saudis will, will, uh, will provide uh, uh, crude oil for the refining sector in China. These are legitimate commercial deals, but they tie up crude oil uh, to a dedicated refinery and potentially reduce the amount of fungible crude that's, that's out there in the marketplace that can be used in a crisis or that can be traded on the marketplace. Uh, to move around. The, China, the Saudis don't allow that with their crude, but it does mean that the amount of crude that they will have for their other customers could be less. Um, but it is these tied deals uh, are important for some. Uh, they are particularly important in Asia because if you look the way the market is moving, uh, the entire crude market is merging or moving into Asia. Asia is the large uh, growth area, as you know, China and India have exponential growth rates. Uh, I think Scott may have some there that show the, the size of the growth rate for uh, transportation fuels and other things in these emerging economies. So it's, a, it's, a, it's a, an important interest to the administration and to U.S. policy that for those countries that have energy policies that are less efficient, less market-based, less price transparent, and less competitive, that they change those energy economies to take out some of the huge efficiencies, inefficiencies there and reduce their demand for oil. Um, because at this stage, these kinds of levels uh, of oil demand are probably not sustainable much past 2025. Um, that is uh, a strategic interest, obviously, uh, of us. So we have, at the end of the day, a marketplace which is changing. We have new players. We have tied deals, we have um, governments being more assertive over what they will extract from the investors. Uh, we have growth in some energy economies that are very high, all of which suggests that the amount of oil that will need it to be produced uh, uh, is going to be higher than we think. And if that's the case, then the question is how fast can production ramp up? I think there is no question that there is enough oil and gas in the marketplace uh, for, uh, to meet demand, expected demand over time. Uh, the question really is producibility. In other words, when will it be produced and what time? And deliverability, how will it be delivered? Uh, and if the market gets fragmented and segregated, that's quite a, quite a different market than we live in today, which is integrated and international. And that's not in our interest as a major consumer, but it's certainly not in our, our interest as uh, a number of our companies are out there competing against these uh, companies under these conditions, which are, which are harmful to them and harmful to us. The final thing in terms of what's going to happen in the future, I mean, that's some oil market changes. The other thing is what will happen with climate change. And I know there are people here who are steeped in climate change and alternative fuels who will talk about this. But it, it strikes me that the debate about climate change is in a point where there is sort of a consensus. There seems to be two views that, that I've heard. One is that we have to do something immediately or the tipping point comes sooner than we think, 
or those saying we have more time, but we have to get that transition going and, and do things about carbon in the atmosphere. I don't know what the answer to this is, but it is clear it's a policy issue of importance that engages governments, engages Congress, it engages companies. Companies are actively looking at ways to manage this issue, uh, and the financial community sees opportunities in it. Uh, it is something that is stirring. It is, to my mind, and I'm sure there are people who will disagree with this, rather undefined. But what happens and in what space and, and how has an impact, very substantial impact on the hydrocarbon market. And that is what it's supposed to do. Uh, because hydrocarbons, uh, for most people, uh, in, in the current situation, and the growth rates of, uh, of gas are too high uh, for sustainability. So that's the issue. Uh, how do we get enough oil uh, in the midterm? How do we avoid the problems that we're seeing in the marketplace? Uh, and third, how do we deal with the, the problems of climate change and alternative fuels? Many thanks. Uh, I wonder if you'd uh, address the uh, question of uh, peak oil a little more explicitly for those of us who've grown up to uh, be <laughs> uh, familiar with the term, if not the meaning. Uh, you're completely excluding the term from your uh, uh, statements. Leaves me a little puzzled. I wonder if you'd sort of amplify on that. Um, or how this? Or how the, is this? Is this on? Uh, a peak oil for those of you uh, who, who have, as I say, have been living in a cave for a couple of years, uh, really uh, came into the public consciousness as a result of a book written by uh, um, a gentleman in Houston. Uh, and what he did was he looked at uh, reports of the Society of Petroleum Engineers, which is a technical professional group, uh, in which governments and companies who have problems solving a particular technical problem will present papers at the SPE, as with all academic organizations, uh, for discussion how they have handled the problem, how they've managed the problem, and how um, they haven't handled it. So he went through these papers um, and decided that uh, the Saudi uh, production profile, if not in decline, was close to being in decline. Now, Saudi Arabia, as you know, has the world's largest share of proven oil reserves. Uh, it has produced over 10 million barrels a day in the past. It's most recently producing in the uh, 7 to 8 million barrel range um, from very few fields. And this prompted uh, this term, peak oil, which became a very, very common, and a lot of people have talked about it. Subsequent to the stirring up of this issue, the Saudis over the past several years have gone out of their way to explain their production profiles, their production management practices. They have given public uh, uh, demonstrations. They have this wonderful uh, um, dog and pony show uh, that they give showing exactly how they recover oil from their large producing reservoirs. and. Uh, I am not a geologist, I'm not a petroleum engineer, but I've seen this a couple of times and I've talked to a number of the Aramco, Saudi oil companies called Aramco, uh, individuals, and they're clearly uh, technically sophisticated uh, and convincing. Um, they talk in principle about something called water cut, which is the amount of water encroachment that's coming into a field, and if it gets too high, uh, the field you know, declines in its oil production, and their water cut numbers have been very, very low. So they have addressed the technical attack on their production uh, programs head on, and I think they have taken some of the steam out of the, out of the technical debate. Now, whether they've taken steam out of the public debate, uh, I, I'm not, I can't judge because uh, I don't believe in peak oil. The reserve base uh, is large, not just in Saudi Arabia, but in the world. Um, <coughs> If you look back over the last uh, 50 years, the, the technology that's used in the oil and gas sector has improved exponentially, which has resulted in greater recovery rates in fields, cheaper exploration costs, uh, easier production. I mean, there's a, whole, there's a whole basket of technological innovation that has driven the oil sector for, for the last uh, 25 or 30 years, and it continues to this day. Uh, so if, 
you believe it is a static picture that if you believe that his the reports that he has uh, are true, then you tend to believe in peak oil. Uh, as someone said, you know, the Stone Age didn't end because of a lack of stones, and there'll probably be oil on the ground when we're into a new uh, energy, uh, uh, an energy economy. Uh, when is that going to be? I don't know, but I would argue that I don't think the peak oil issue um, is one that you should believe that peak oil is now uh, happening in um, 20, 2010 or 2011. I think the technical and producing evidence uh, is quite substantial in the other way. Um, <clears throat> a couple of other things happened in 1970. There was a uh, opening up of a new oil field <clears throat> um, and an increased supply in this country before Reagan took power. Um, and uh, Carter uh, started several movements towards alternative energy. For instance, windmills were going up. And uh, when uh, Reagan uh, announced the total de deregulation of oil, he also put an end to those uh, 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 other efforts that, that uh, Carter had made to make us less dependent on oil. Uh, but I, somehow your, your comments don't jive with the obscene profits that are being made by the oil companies and the massive increase in our uh, gas prices. Um, uh, putting aside the whole issue of the um, of the uh, of the uh, uh, deregulation of um, the ta toxicity uh, produced from the consumption of fossil oils, it just seems to me that your picture is, uh, is somewhat. Um, uh, it doesn't quite fit. Uh, I think it doesn't fit, uh, let's just say, in the sense of the massive profits you're making and the massive increase in the oil prices. And I was wondering um, how you account for that. Well, I'm not, I'm not in the financial business. I mean, in the oil sector, um, and, I, and I'm not going to defend or attack profits of any companies. I mean, I don't own oil stocks. I don't work for an oil company. I have no vested interest in this one way or the other. I'm reflecting on the hydrocarbon economy we live in. If the participants in that uh, are making what you consider high-obscene profits, I would say, you know, people in hedge funds do too. I mean, I'm, you know, that's, that's fine. I mean, that's, there's nothing I can do about it. I'm trying to describe how a hydrocarbon economy works in the commercial sector and how companies uh, operate. Um, keep in mind that in the, in the 80s, companies actually, because it's a commodity business, uh, didn't make obscene profits. Uh, some of them made significant losses. Uh, some went broke. Some went out of business. Um, that's the nature of the cyclical business that they're in. Uh, and it's up to them to decide, uh, as private companies, how they're actually going to manage their asset base. Um, it is, we were talking about this earlier, it is also true that companies have invested uh, in alternative fuels, they've invested in technologies and academic institutions to find answers to some of the questions that are out there. So um, they, they are, they're trying to cover all of the opportunities and costs that they see coming down the pike. Um, you know, I can't predict profits, I can't, you know, speak to that. I mean, you would have to ask a CEO or a politician about that, uh, but that, I'm neither one of those. This is, this is the way the market is. Um, uh, it seems to me the market's changing a bit, and I wonder if you could make some comments on a few things. Um, I was struck 
by the absence of any discussion of corporate social responsibility in uh, your comments. And having just returned a while ago from Chad, which gets about 13% of its profits from petroleum, the rest goes to the international oil sector, and this is maybe the fourth or fifth poorest country in the world. Um, it seems to me that there are massive challenges for both governments, all governments, consuming and producing, um, and for companies that are now working in areas like West Africa. And I wonder what your thinking is on issues of corporate social responsibility, what is the role of companies working in desperately poor countries, countries that are conflict-ridden, um, what is a fair share um, between consumers and producers about the, about the profits from petroleum? I'd like you to comment on that. Well, I, this, I would, I'm going to dodge that. I'm a U.S. government official. I can't speak to how governments run their economies. That's not, that's not my responsibility. Um, that is true um, that uh, there are that, that oil money is diverted. I mean, I'm sure of that. I don't have any proof of that, but uh, it, just look around. Um, if you if you say that's that's a problem, fair enough. If there are the various groups that are trying to get to that question, and companies have signed up for some of those, so I mean, that seems to be underway. Um, but if it if governance is the basic issue that we're talking about here, then how do you actually change the governance? Uh, that seems to me the bigger problem. How do you ensure that you get governments that are uh, transparent and honest and freely elected and uh, all those kinds of things? And that's a, I think there's, a, there's perhaps a discussion about that uh, tomorrow. That's a tough question. Um, the companies that I have, I'm aware of when they invest, uh, they don't invest uh, or divert or participate in that. I mean, it's, it's illegal under the U.S. law, but they are very careful about it and they push for transparency. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's not up to them. Uh, it's up to the host government. Uh, you said that uh, most of our oil companies uh, work on a market-based system while we're starting to compete a lot now with state-owned companies um, that can generate a lot of debt weight loss, such as China's, but um, their governments will basically subsidize their losses. On top of that, we're losing, um, I guess, traditional oil fields that we um, had major investments in, such as the um, Orinoco field in Venezuela, um, where basically Chavez is um, seed forcing uh, ExxonMobil and um, BP Amoco to see control of those fields to pay the visa. So um, with these losses, wouldn't it be a lot more feasible, not just from an environmental perspective, but from an economic perspective to begin major investments in renewable energy now before um, we basically lose our supply of uh, oil? Uh, fine with me. I'd be ha happy to see more investment in renewable energy. I don't Think I'm not sure it's a lack. I mean, there's other people here who know this know better than I do. I don't think it's a lack of investment, but lack of opportunities. I mean, there's been a fair amount of renewable energy investment over the past several years of different kinds, and you know, can that market grow? Certainly, it can grow. Um, and I don't think there's any barriers. There may be some economic competitive barriers in the internal marketplace. There may be some technical problems. There may be some infrastructure uh, uh, constraints, but. Uh, I think the capital uh, is there for investment in renewable fuels if it can compete and turn a profit. I think that's no question about that. Um, I teach economics here at the University of Chicago, so I was wondering, my question is somewhat pedagogical. From listening to the comments and questions of your audience, I I, and I find this among my students as well, this is, seems to be a very big a misunderstanding that um, although everybody feels like they're hit in their pocketbook by high oil prices, 
in essence, it's the best tool that we have for conservation. High oil prices would induce different allocation of resources. People would be more sparing. They would think about city planning in ways that conserve oil. They can think about public transportation as a more viable opportunity. Um, as a government official, I would ask, why is there not a better effort to articulate this, to talk about taxes on gasoline? Um, the, U the US versus Europe patterns of taxation are incredibly different. If people think $3 a ga uh, per gallon is high, they should do their math, convert the liter's price of oil in Europe, and, and find that they're paying closer to 10 in Europe. Um, so what do you have to say to that? Uh, I agree with you that uh, the price signals to the economy, uh, and there are much very good economists here who will probably, probably speak to this tomorrow, that do uh, encourage alternatives. They do encourage uh, transformation. They do encourage uh, conservation, all of that. Um, I think the only thing that's, that's surprising in this cycle is that the demand restraint to higher prices has been less dramatic than people assumed it would be. And so the demand continues to grow, um, not just in China and India and here, but in the Middle East and elsewhere. Now, partly in the Middle East, it's a function of the price for gasoline that's paid in the domestic market, which is heavily subsidized. Um, so they're not, the price signals aren't moving through. But I think I said earlier that we like internationally integrated market economies because those prices go through to the consumer as quickly as possible. Uh, and that, that, that does translate into higher prices when, when prices go up almost immediately at the gas pump and various other places. And to the extent that the governments don't allow that to happen, you don't get that benefit. Um, so, I, so yes, there is that economic analysis which, which suggests that that should happen. Um, I'm sorry, I, didn't, I don't remember the second part of the, of the question. Oh, there's, there, there's government discussion of, uh, of, of a whole range of financial instruments uh, all the time. Sometimes it's more intense than others. Um, uh, the, the tax, the gasoline taxation issues has been discussed uh, in the industry and in the government for the last 35 years. Uh, uh, for those of us who lived in Europe back in, in the 60s, uh, we heard about it, that you don't tax gasoline enough. And, that has been a debate in this, uh, in this political system for a long time, but there has never been uh, enough of uh, political support uh, to move gasoline tax at the federal level up. I mean, gasoline taxes at the state level are, are much more substantial. Um, but it's debated. It's constantly debated. You can, it's probably going to be debated in the, in the Congress uh, now in some of these, in some of these uh, energy bills. Um, so. That, that, is, that is out there. Um, there's also all sorts, if you, if, you look, if you go in and look at what has happened over the past several years in terms of both government spending on alternative fuels, you look at fiscal incentives, um, uh, uh, loan guarantees, and all those kinds of things for alternative fuels, they're out there in the marketplace. I mean, the U.S. is putting out a notice for a loan guarantee program for alternative fuel technologies. Uh, so, yes, the government is using its fiscal instruments, uh, but taxes, as you know, uh, are a hugely controversial issue and requires action by a whole lot of political people before it, it gets done. One real quick question. Kind of on the tail end of that one, instead of uh, alternatives for energy, just the fiscal uh, efforts by the government for alternatives of transportation. If you could elaborate on that a little more. You mean direct subsidies to consumers? Yeah, or just investment <coughs> in, you know, there's tax benefits for oil companies to, to um, do research. If, what about research for alternative modes of transportation, things like that? Oh, there's, there's, a, there's a huge amount of money spent on that. Uh, yeah, the hydrogen car being little. the most, the hydrogen car being the one that was most prevalent the last couple of years. But. Yes, Mr. Haberg, uh, can you uh, comment something about this globalization of economy? I knew that the petroleum industry as a whole 
is a big part of our economic sector. But <coughs> with our increasing prospect of uh, devaluation of our U.S. dollars, are you be able to uh, comment something about the competition on the global res petroleum resources versus the U.S. dollar weakness? And what's your projection of the next two years? Are, uh, are the scenario of uh, $80 per barrel is, is, is something that we're looking forward to? Or back to the peak oil scenario that the Saudis can uh, open up his valve and uh, we're, we're talking about $12 barrel again. Thank you. <coughs> I, I don't do financial projections. I can't balance my checkbook. I mean, it's... Uh, you know, I don't know what's going to happen uh, with devaluation, and I, there are others here who might want to speak to that. Um, and so I don't know, I don't have any idea what the impact would be in the marketplace. I assume there would be an impact on the marketplace. Um, there has always, there have been episodes of conversation about uh, changing uh, the way in which uh, oil is traded and, and put it into a basket or into euros and and none of the players in that game want to change from the dollar. The dollar is the means for contracts uh, in the oil sector. Uh, there was, I think, the, the Iranians tried to do something with euros a, a few months ago. I don't know how that's, uh, that's played out, but uh, at this point, people are willing to use the dollar as a medium of exchange uh, and to hold them uh, as reserves, although I assume that some are probably getting out of dollars and into other things as a hedge. But... I have no way of knowing that, and I have no way of knowing how that market is going to work. But stay around and ask tomorrow, and you might find an economist who actually uh, has done some thinking about that. Can you uh, just speak for a second on, on the situation in Iraq? I know that there's been different reports as to how what percentage of their oil fields are operational after all of the chaos that's been going on there, and whether production now is, is larger than production previous to the war, and, and what effect the overall conditions of the country have on the country's long-term capacity to be um, an oil producing company that an oil producing country that helps stabilize its own economy. Yeah, I, I, just to say one thing in advance, the U.S. government is not involved in uh, the negotiations among the Iraqi parties over a hydrocarbon law. There is a draft hydrocarbon law that the Iraqis have, the Kurds, I think, published back in February or March, but uh, we are not participants in that debate. This is the Iraqis doing that themselves, as is the revenue-sharing law, which are the two big pieces of legislation that they would like to get passed by the end of, uh, the end of this month. Um, and as I understand the debate within Iraq over the law, and I'll come to the fields in a minute, uh, there is the issue of uh, who's going to control what. And as you can imagine, the, the Kurds want to control certain fields in their area, the Shias want to control fields in their area, and the Sunnis who don't have much in the way of oil in the areas where they are principally uh, don't get very much. So that has to be resolved internally uh, among, the, uh, among the various parties. And revenue sharing, it's like uh, revenue sharing issues everywhere. And I, th I suspect, I don't know this, but I suspect the, comp the, the, the issue is uh, who gets paid when. I mean, if the money that comes in goes immediately out to the regions, a certain percentage, uh, that means that it doesn't go to the central bank, it isn't handled, and parts of it disappear into costs and everything else. Uh, so revenue sharing uh, are, are tough issues in any context, and it's not surprising that uh, they're a tough issue in Iraq. Um, as I said, the, uh, there are 27 producing oil fields and another 24 uh, that have been discovered which aren't producing. Um, as, as, as I understand it, um, and this is based solely on what you, you hear in the trade press, um, on the producing fields, some of them have been uh, produced uh, in a way that damages the reservoir. When producing an oil field, you have to be uh, systematic so as to maximize the returns, maximize the recovery, and all those things. And if you don't do that and apply technology to do that, you can actually uh, damage the reservoir. I'll just give you an example. Um, there is a very large reservoir in Russia called Samitlor, for those of you who know Russia. Uh, and the Russians lost that reservoir because they produced it incorrectly, and it was BPT and K that went back to bring back part of that. 
uh, reservoir so that reservoir uh, can reproduce again. It's costly to do that, and the Iraqis have hired some of the private companies to go in and get, look at the reservoirs, tell them what the problems are. This is very common uh, in the trade. Um, and then they will give them a report to the government and say, okay, this, if you want to take production from, and I'm giving, this is an, an, an illustrative example. If you want to take uh, reservoir production from 500,000 to 600,000 barrels a day within two years, it will cost you $500 million, and you will have to do these kinds of things. These are the kinds of things you would apply the technology. Um, and since there are several very large reservoirs, I assume what the Iraqis will do is we'll look at those to bring those back up as quickly as possible once they get agreement on who's going to, to control them and run them. Um, what happens uh, after they produce? Well, these, some of these reservoirs are very large. Uh, they have not been depleted very much, which means their, their life and their opportunity to produce them is quite substantial looking out into the future. And I don't know how uh, the Iraq government will, will manage its resource base. It seems to me that the needs in that society are so great, the financial needs, that it would be uh, possible, it would probably be recommended, although I'm not recommending that, that they would get as many of those reservoirs that can produce, without damage the reservoir, up and producing as quickly as possible. That way you can maximize the revenue, which is what the society needs. I mean, people need money, uh, the society needs money. Um, and that could mean that you, you could stabilize production, say, at two and a half million barrels a day, then incrementally up it to three million. And by you know four or five years out there, you could you could be over four or maybe even more. Uh, but it's a strategy that the Iraqi government has to decide how to do. How do you produce your reservoir? At what pace do you want to bring new reservoirs on and production up? And it's also a function of the infrastructure. The infrastructure, um, the, the refining infrastructure is in very poor shape. It's, it's been heavily damaged and, and uh, ignored. And the pipeline system is obviously going to, to be upgraded and needed. And then there will be uh, additional compressors and capacity in the infrastructure to make it happen. Keep in mind two things about Iraq's oil production. During the period that Saddam was there, um, they would produce. Uh, Iraq did not do a lot of seismic work or a lot of work on its reservoirs to sort of find out how much more they had because the, the objective here was to produce, produce, produce. That was to generate cash. And so some of that, those damages to reservoirs date from that period when they were overproduced and badly produced uh, under political instructions to do that. Um, and so, you know, to get them back up, uh, requires a fair amount of attention. Now, they may be, um, some of these reservoirs may be very, very good reservoirs that need very little attention and capital to bring them back, and others may need more. But until there's a systematic evaluation uh, of them, I think it's probably too soon to say uh, which ones will go. Now, what, what they've done is looked at a couple of them, and they've got some ideas from those, uh, but this is the point that uh, there are places in the world that have, are underexplored, and to, if you, you do tend to find more in hydrocarbon producing provinces because there are already hydrocarbon producing provinces. So I, I would say that the outlook for the Iraqis over time, all things being equal, are, are quite encouraging. Uh, getting up there systematically um, uh, and without any problems, security problems and continued fighting uh, could, could prove a real challenge. 